I'll be 48 in late January. I can remember 10, 20, 30 years ago. If I try hard, I can remember 40 years ago. There are bits of memory left over from that period in my life. I cannot remember 47 years ago. I can't remember anything. But to remember 47 years ago is possible. There are plenty of things that happened 47 years ago that my father remembers. So that which happened 47 years ago is rememberable, even though I can't remember it. Now, I also know that, um, based upon my own minor studies in uh, the way infants learn things, that they can learn a lot more, and they can retain a lot more than adults can because they're, as they say, a blank slate, or what appears to be a blank slate to us. Uh, they just absorb everything that ever comes at them. <clears throat> now, I often wonder if what we're learning when, when we learn to learn, when we learn to perceive things according to the plane of existence that we're born in, is not some sort of overwriting of a completely different um, prior view of things, view of everything. Because I should be able to remember um, 47 and a half years ago. I should be able to remember that because my father can. Um, and my mind was more active, as far as we understand infant psychology and infant memory, than his would have been at the time because my mind was, the, was this blank slate again. But I don't remember any of it. But do I actually remember it? But the points of reference that I have to use in order to remember things now have changed so radically from when I was an infant that <clears throat> it sort of made it impossible for me to use what has now become memorization or the um, imagination of memory from what it was back then. Uh, all these things like time, space, causality, um, up, down, left, right, good, bad, uh, feels good, feels bad, etc., etc. I had to learn um, when I was born. This isn't just innately there, although I suppose it might be, but if all my um, musings have led me to the conclusion that everything has to be learned. You have to learn. You have to learn what gravity is. You have to learn what inertia and movement are. Uh, that sort of thing. So can you imagine what perception would be like without any of these things learned yet? What your perception of reality itself would be? You're still looking at the same thing as an adult does, but it's all completely different. Because, again, all the assumptions and all the tools that we use to engage our own memory are absent. So it's perhaps, perhaps it's possible that my memory of my early infancy is still as intact as ever, but my memory, my capacity to remember things has fallen into a furrow, um, which makes it extremely difficult, perhaps not impossible, but probably very difficult, to remember what it was like when I was six months old. Whereas the memories may actually be in there, but my own memories may be so completely incomprehensible to me now that I can't really draw upon them. <clears throat> now... The same thing, I suppose, could be said for sleep, or dreamless sleep, or deep sleep, or uh, an intoxicated state, or uh, a heavily sedated state. I once had five teeth extracted all at once. They were all uh, baby teeth that wouldn't come out, and they all had to be taken out at once. I was put under. I had no notion whatsoever of the passage of time when I awoke. But maybe I did have consciousness of all of this taking place, but all my normal sensory apparatus had been, as it were, placed out of gear, and it was just pure consciousness itself. And the fact that I couldn't remember what was happening uh, in that state of uh, extreme sedation and extreme anesthesia didn't really so much have to do with the fact that I wasn't perceiving anything, but the way I was perceiving everything was so radically different from the way I perceived things after I woke up that, of course, I couldn't remember any of it. I couldn't make sense out of it because, again, up, down, left, right, gravity, causality, inertia, uh, pleasure, pain, all of this, all of this had been temporarily deadened. Um, so the fact that my memory had changed uh, from a point of, um, or my ability to, to cognitively draw upon memory had been 
deadened at that point when I was uh, when I was uh, anesthetized. Therefore, when I was back to myself again, I couldn't remember any of it because my the mechanisms that I now rely upon for memory, i.e., visualization that sort of thing, were out. It doesn't mean that I was actually asleep at that point; that I actually was out of it. What it means is maybe. I'm just speculating here. Maybe my reality had been altered to the point where I had lost the capacity to remember it once I came to, in the same way as I can't remember what it was like when I was two months old. Um, but again, it is possible to remember 48 years ago. It is rememberable. There are plenty of people alive that remember what it was like 48 years ago, before I was born. Um, I can't remember what it was like up until, I don't have even the remotest flashes of memory up until about the age of two. So, um, does this mean that, I, that that memory is not there? No, but what it means is maybe the uh, capacity of uh, my conscious mind now to draw upon that memory has been altered by familiarity with this world and all its assumptions. Again, you could say that about deep sleep. You could say that about deep dreamless sleep. You could say that about any number of states which are sort of altered states from the normal consciousness that we have the working day, everyday consciousness. Now, in antinatalism and depression, um, I'm linking the two, and I'm doing it quite blatantly. I don't uh, hide that fact. Um, <clears throat> and what I do think is, and I, I'm sort of restating what I said in the very beginning of this series, is that um, you may be, when you're dealing with a depressed individual, you may be dealing with someone who has such a fundamentally different view of reality itself that you may simply lack the points of reference necessary to communicate with that person. I can imagine fewer um, states to have more difficulty uh, getting through to someone than the depressed individual, the person who is fundamentally negative about the universe, simply because you're entirety of all your assumptions is so different from that depressed individual's assumptions, especially someone who is perfectly lucid, perfectly coherent, and highly intelligent who is depressed, um, your sort of your point of view is so different from theirs that um, it might not even be um, a case of um, miscommunication as inability to communicate. Um, you cannot, it's, it's so hard to to get somebody to sort of step into your reality. Um, when, you, when you deal with people who are depressed or when you deal with people who are highly intelligent, especially and highly articulate and imaginative who are depressed, uh, what got me thinking was Thomas Ligotti, um, <clears throat> the novelist who is, um, writes fundamentally negative things and he's highly intelligent and highly, or he strikes me as highly intelligent and highly imaginative, but whose imagination is strangely <clears throat> hobbled by the fact that it, it looks as though he can't imagine goodness. It is somehow blocked from seeing this. However intelligent he is, however um, uh, intellectual, intellectually imaginative he is, however articulate he is, there's something preventing him from seeing anything that's positive. Now, this man is not stupid. This man is not an idiot. But neither is the person who is... Um, positive and highly intelligent and highly highly articulate. Uh, it's just that they live in two separate universes, which, again, this makes uh, depression so difficult a thing to unsnarl if it's uh, the sort of depression that one thinks oneself into. If it's clinical and you can medicate yourself and fix it, that's one thing. But if you have the sort of mental cul-de-sac that has resulted in depression, that's extremely hard to get somebody out of because first of all they have to even recognize that they have an issue whereas the the morbid antinatalist seems to think that no no I'm seeing reality so clearly that anyone who disagrees with me is not seeing it clearly that's that's the thing about value that's the thing about memory that's the thing about perception am I seeing anything less clearly than I was when I was six months old no but I have no way of comparing the two mental states to each other, or it's extremely difficult for me to do that. Um, which, <clears throat> I suppose in a sense, sort of points to the futility of making this 95 plus videos. But I think that uh, anyone who's actually 
fought themselves into that blind alley, into that pointlessness, and has somehow managed to drag themselves out. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, can relate to this. You sort of think, okay, I understand that what I'd done was I'd thought the universe into a state of extreme negativity, and I was faced with the possibility of either self-extinction or thinking my way out of it. And <clears throat> what you, I'm sure that probably a lot of people who think themselves into that condition either kill themselves or sort of drift through life and then die. Um, but a lot of people do come out of it. And <clears throat> what I'm trying to sort of get at is the, the fundamental difference between the depressed individual and the non-depressed individual. Um, it's not so much that the depressed individual is negative while the non-depressed person is positive, which is actually, if you ask me, the way the depressed person sees it. But the person who is depressed is negative, and the non-depressed person is neither negative or positive. Because I would say that someone who is relentlessly positive and refuses to you know, see any bad in the world and is hooray for everything is just as crazy as the depressed individual. How do you compare the two states of, of being, the person who is depressed and the person who is not depressed? How do you sort of get through the fundamental otherness that's inherent in that relationship? that's based upon things like memory, time, space, perception, everything. How do I communicate with a six-month-old infant? How do I communicate with the cat, which, as usual, is snoring away on the couch over there? It's not that, that we can't communicate. It's just that our minds work so completely differently that communication is extremely circumscribed by that fact, by the fact that we are so different, our cognitions are different. That, I think... Um, sort of says why I've made this huge number of videos. It speaks to that. But it also says uh, why I ultimately think that no matter how many videos I make, if I make a thousand more on this subject, there's a certain degree of futility about it. We Attempting to <clears throat> reconcile the depressed and the non-depressed may be um, a fool's errand. It may not be something that's possible. Well, no, I shouldn't say that it's not possible, but it may be something that one must take a lot more seriously than a lot of people seem to think. You're not dealing with someone who is uh, who is who just needs a little bit of adjustment here. You're dealing with someone who has a fundamentally different view of absolutely everything. That's what fascinates me about the entire thing, and it's. I think it's also why I've uh, I've sort of gotten so heavily into it uh, in this in this series because it's a, it's going to be one of the dominating themes of my entire life. I think. Thank you.